Welcome to the crossover with Joe R. Lucas, and it's a special edition. This is quite different from what I'm used to doing, and you're here listening to it also. Today, I get to share the stage with people that live behind the office doors that take up the day-to-day, the week-to-week, the month-to-month, the year-to-year duties, the guys that really only show up after the team has already achieved something special, but they're also the piece that keeps the team together, keeps them on top, keeps them winning, and keeps the peace a difficult time. So today I have the privilege and the honor to sit down with three of the best GMs in all of Europe. I will now introduce each one individually and we can move on to hear their stories from the inside. This should be an interesting uh, interesting podcast. First of all, gentlemen, I want to thank you guys for taking a time out to be my guest today. Thank you for being here. Let me start out with you, Maurizio Gherardini, born on September 22nd, 1955 in Foley, Italy, spent a year when he was 17 as an exchange student in St. Louis in the USA, attended a high school there, and even played some hoops. Later on, returned to Italy, played a bit for his home club in Pallacanestro Forli, but was short-lived as he took over as assistant coach looking after younger teams. And as we talked about earlier, Maurizio, that was a long time ago. <laughs> he talked to American players, Larry McDonald and Rod Griffin, and to come to Italy to play. And that doesn't sound that difficult back then, but Griffin was a 17th pick in the NBA draft. So Maurizio is obviously destined for this. The rest is history. GM of his club for nine years, 14th season with Benetton Treviso, numerous Italian championships, EuroLeague Final Fours, then off to Toronto as an assistant GM to Brian Colangelo. And now, of course, with Fenerbahce and Becco in Istanbul. Maurizio, welcome to the crossover. How are you, sir? Doing good. Thank you for having me. I, you know, I'm, you know, excited at the idea of, uh, you know, sharing this time with you and my, my two colleagues, you know, because I know they will have some interesting stories as well, you know, and not because I'm just the oldest guy around here, you know. <laughs> We're, in order, in order, it's, it's you, then me, then Stavros, uh, or, or then Christos. So, and now for Christos. Born on June 29, 1965, in Greece, Christos Stavropoulos, interestingly enough, would head to Italy and study at the University of Trieste, 1989, to be, of all things, a pharmacist. Doesn't make much sense here with the basketball world, but he dabbled in some journalism, a little bit of newspaper, a little bit of television, also worked at the Greek consulate. And in 95, he became an agent of the players and returned to Athens to become sports director at Olympiakos, a club that everybody knows and loves. Well, not everybody loves, but everybody knows where they are for sure. One year later, he was named the GM of that club and was there until 2019 before heading to his present home of Armani Exchange Milan. Christos, welcome, my man. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be with you. Uh, thank you for for being here. This is a, it, it, it was it's hard to get one player together. I can't believe we got three GMs. You guys are making make, make life my life a little bit easier. <laughs> and now off the Paulius, but the Yunas, right? Is that does that sound right? Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> I'm Lithuanian. I'm supposed to get that better. Born February 6, nineteen eighty one, in Kaunas, Paulius. Supposedly had it difficult. He loves basketball, but from what I understand, his mother loved it even more and wanted him to play as much as he could. He got to the Lithuanian cadet team in 1997 for the European qualifiers. But after a few years after that, he took to the books a master's degree in international relations in 2005. He was invited by Salgirdis to interview for the communications director position a couple years later. He was also by, invited by then GM Genus Rukauskas to become more involved in the day-to-day of putting the team together. After some financial issues within the city, Paulius was surprisingly appointed to the, as the team's GM and obviously remains there today and taking on double duty as president and manager. Paulius, welcome to the crossover. How are you, sir? Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. Great to be part of this group. Um, I'm, I'm here to listen. I'm, and I'm doing <laughs> good it's, to see these, these faces. And, and these names to, to learn from from uh, Maurizio and 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 you and and Christos, it's gonna be a great time. Thank Come you. On, you, you guys are all pretty. Are, are you guys all friends outside the, the 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 confines of the court? If y'all get to know each other, or is this the first time that some of you have been together? No, I think uh, I think I don't know how you picked the three of us, but if <laughs> I can speak for 
Christos and Paulus as well. Surprisingly enough, I think we're really good friends off the court as well. And that helps uh, in many directions. That helps the basketball sharing and the mm -hmm. life sharing. So I think, uh, I think we are professionals, but I think we're friends in first place. And uh, even if I didn't like the fact that you underline my birth date, because it now, you know, you can almost feel that Paulius could be my son. But uh, I, I look at Christos as a younger brother, at least. But uh, I think we're, I'm not wrong. I don't think I'm wrong when I say that we're, we're good friends off the court, away from basketball as well. That's good, because Paulius could almost be my son also. So don't feel bad. <laughs> All right, let's get, let's get this thing going. I got a question right now for pretty much all three of you. All right, so what day was it you knew that this was, the, this was your future? This was the job for you? you? Some of you guys, obviously, as I said, with Paul, they played basketball before. Mauricio, you tell me, you also. Christos, I'm not sure if you played a little bit or not, but was it just like you got to the point where I talked to some coaches around the league in this in this crossover that they came to the point where they said look at i'm not going to be able to play this game i'm not going to be able to get to that level of playing but you wanted to stay with the game some decided coaching in your cases you decided as a gm when was that day for you when did you decide that that was the the, the direction you wanted to go in let's start with christos okay uh you know, I start I start my basketball career in uh, in Italy when uh, when I study here in Italy, and uh, I start to work like a journalist and uh, then like an agent, and uh, I was an agent for almost uh, seven eight years. Uh, when I came back in Greece, that uh, was back in uh, 1907, uh, I worked there for for like an agent for two more years until 2000. And on 2000, Olympiacos made me uh, this proposal to join them. And, uh, and for me, it was, uh, was a great proposal, was a great, uh, great idea. And uh, immediately, uh, I start uh, this, uh, this uh, journey in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the basketball team. Uh, and I continue until uh, until uh, today. It was a beautiful journey, a beautiful stories, a beautiful uh, beautiful uh, moments, and uh, I saw that uh, this was uh, you was perfect for me. What I believed and uh, what I'm, I'm I was uh, looking to to find, and so uh, I'm very I'm very happy for that. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I work uh, all these years for big clubs, uh, for 19 years with Olympiacos, and now uh, from uh, uh, one year, one year and a half, I'm in another big club, historical club like Armani Milan. Paulius, you, 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 you seem like you were just kind of thrown into this a little bit and, and you found yeah. your way. I, I still believe I can be a player. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Your mom would like that. Yeah, yeah but that's the joke I, I've been having for like, I think last 10 years, but, uh, but the story is that, uh, so I started playing when I was six and when I was uh, around 27, 28, I came to work into the club. So all the time till that I was playing basketball. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what uh, Euroleague level or professional, professional level is. And I was always thinking that, you know, I, I'll finish school and then, you know, I can still be turn pro or be semi-pro. I don't know. But then when I started to work in the club and I, I remember it to this day, like I saw the first practice and I did not understand how, you know, how the guys had so much strength, how fast they were. And it just hit me then. I'm like, dude, you're not going to be that level. And... <laughs> And it was just like that. I'm like, okay. I, and I didn't think I was going to be a GM. I just, I started working in the club. And, and that's after that first practice, I understood that the hope of being a professional player and playing for Jargiris is over. And I started to work in the club. So not as a GM, but, but uh, working in basketball and, and being with basketball was the goal. So that's, sadly, that's when it hit me, even though I still joke that I could come back and, and play one game. 
hey, you know what? The, the, the most important thing in life is realizing it. You know, that's, that's the, the realizing and accepting it. Those are the most important things. Some people don't accept it and they keep pushing. I, you know, I gave up on that. <laughs> Maurizio, what was, what was the moment for you? Was it bringing over those two American guys from Italy and saying, hey, this could be well, a job for me? I, you know, I realized soon enough that I couldn't play. I mean, couldn't play at a, at a, at a high enough level, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking more, you know, the coaching aspect of the business, you know. I love, you know, being at practice. Uh, by a series of coincidences, uh, I, I became assistant coach of the team in Fort Lee, my hometown. I, by other, let's say, connections, I started working on the, I was the editor of the coaches' magazines that we were producing for the coaches. I was translating book. Whatever fascinated me was the, the coaching side of, you know, the equation. But then, uh, then I guess you're right. When 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 I was able to bring Rod Griffin to 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 a small town like Fort Lee by uh, you know through the connection and and uh, and uh, let's say uh, situation that I had to manage uh, because everything started on inviting a team like Wake Forest to do a, a touring uh, a visit of Italy to open up the gym in Venice. That's how I connected to Wake Forest. The summer that Rod Griffin was graduated and was a first round NBA draft. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that was the first time that any, uh, let's say, NBA draftee was coming to Europe out of the draft, not considering, I'm not talking about the guys who came for academic reason, either right. Bradley or, or McMillan, you know, but I'm talking about that was the first time that ever a first round pick was coming to Europe. And, uh, and I remember how I spent the time to go to Rome, to the Rome International Tennis Tournament, to meet with Donald Dell, <laughs> who was the big boss of ProServe, to convince him to let Griffin, who just had been cut, but our season was not starting before November 1st, to come to a small place like Fort Lee. So that was an interesting trip and conversation. I remember how Donald Dell said, I'm going to send you Rod and my youngest lawyer that we just uh, hired, and you discuss the picture with them. And this <laughs> young lawyer, who never done any, any contract in his life, spent seven days in Fort Lee, Italy, eating every day at my mother's uh, <laughs> table, you know, noodles and tortelli and, and yeah. this young lawyer, at the end of seven days, decided to go ahead and sign the contract for Rod Griffin. This young lawyer was David Falk, who became oh, no way. Michael Jordan agent, etc., etc., etc. So at that moment, I said, "Hey, if I've been able to achieve all this for a small, you know, place like for the Italy, maybe the management side is is very, 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 very interesting." And uh, and actually, it happened that. A year later, a new coach arrived, and uh, you know, small places in in small clubs with big, uh, uh, you know, ownership group. And mm -hmm. uh, in my case, 35 people were owning the club, and 35 people in, in the town of Fort Lee meant uh, politician, uh, engineers, doctors. You know, the town was represented in this. Uh, board of owners and right. the new coach came in who was one of the let's say greatest persons i ever met in my life and he's not with us anymore uh, giancarlo Asteo. and he said maurizio i'd be happy to have you as assistant because i was on paper the assistant coach but i feel like i need more someone between me and 35 people that i don't really know how about taking over as a sport director or GM or whatever. Let's go and talk to the, the board. And the board, you know, kind of was surprised by the coach's request, but they decided to trust, uh, you know, a young guy. And, and that was exactly 40 years ago. And that's, that's so I started my career 40 years ago on, on this uh, coach's suggestion to the board. Those, those are three 
incredible stories, but the one thing that I, they all have in common is that you guys realize that you couldn't play basketball. <laughs> That's the most important thing. But th those are great stories. I love yeah. it. I love, I love the, the way, because I, I love to realize how people got to where they are. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people who study to do something and they follow their career that they studied for and so on and so on. Other people just kind of like end up somewhere. And that's where you guys ended up doing this and obviously doing a great job. Let's go over what I think is probably one of the most important aspects of the job. I, I think you guys have to have relationships with everybody, good or bad. I mean, relationships is, is part of your business on a daily basis. The one relationship you'd have to have is with your, with your boss. With the, the guy who employs you, the person that employs you. Christos, in your case, your boss is just a little bit more than an owner of a basketball club, I understand. I, I, I hear he's like some kind of fashion guy in, in the fashion industry or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Some, somebody <laughs> told me this Armani name is important somewhere. I don't know. I mean, but how, how is it with, with Mr. Armani? Is he like there day to day? I mean, do you have contact with him? Uh I would like, you know, to, yes, is no, no, we, we have, we are very, we are very lucky to have uh, here in Milan, this uh, fantastic owner that uh, supports the team uh, every day uh, and give us the freedom uh, to take uh, our decision. Uh, but uh, I would like uh, to talk about uh, uh, the, the role of, uh, of uh, the GM uh, in the basketball club uh, in, uh, in Europe. I think that is, uh, uh, is probably uh, different from club to club. Uh, depends depends uh, by the internal structure of, of the organization. Uh, as I said, in our organization, Mr. Armani, and the president, Mr. Delorco, give us uh, the freedom uh, to, to, to decide. Uh, but uh, even in the same country, every club has, has different needs. Uh, so the, uh, the description of uh, the, the GM role is uh, different and changes a lot from, from club to club. Uh, here in Milan, uh, we have uh, coach Ettore Messina, the Hall of Fame Ettore Messina, who is also the president of the basketball operation. Uh, the, the, the GM job, my job here is to translate the owner values, Mr. Armani values, the coach and uh, president of basketball operation Ettore values in day-to-day -day operation. Uh, concerned to building the team, programming the future, uh, running the operation, overseeing every department and like communication, uh, marketing. Uh, is a huge job, but uh, I try every day to handle with the help of uh, my uh, colleagues and collaborators. Uh, I would like to, uh, to say at this point that uh, uh, we, we have some, uh, some examples, uh, for example, in the English Premier League. In the past, uh, we had uh, two coaches like uh, Arsene Wenger and uh, Sir Alex Ferguson that mm -hmm. were the type of managers who decide everything. Right. Now, today, this is different. For example, Pepe Guardiola and Klopp, they have their own managers, their own GMs, their own sports directors that they handle and they are running the team together every day. Here in Milan, our hashtag is insieme, that means together. And this is not a slogan, this is the way we operate. We operate all together, insieme. Perfect. Uh, uh, Maurizio, in, in your case, what's your relationship with the president? I guess the president, Ali Coates, no? Yeah. Is, is the president. What, what's your relationship on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I, uh, he's definitely a very busy person because he represents <laughs> the, you know, the biggest 
let's say, group of companies in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So he's, uh, he's an extremely busy man. And also, as you know, Fenerbahce is a, is a club that includes nine different branches. So it's, right. a, it's a huge club. But still, no matter how, how let's say, variegated and, and, and big we are, uh, uh, Mr. You know, Mr. Coach is a basketball uh, passionate follower. And uh, is, that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it depends if you win or if you lose. <laughs> you know, it's always the same thing. But he, he comes to all our games. He mm -hmm. brings us his support. And, uh, and, uh, and again, the, the, the good thing is uh, the desire to always, uh, let's say, uh, support the basketball section and, and give us the tools to be as successful as we can possibly be. Again, um, we just went through a very, let's say, uh, trans let, let's call it a transition time over the summer, which was not very simple to go through, but right. uh, definitely we never lack his support. And at the same time, his support also translated into uh, uh, the opportunity to, for us to have everything we could to face changes, uh, pandemic emergy, emergencies and everything. And we had a, a new board, uh, you know, branch president, Sertac Consuolo, that uh, basically is uh, living our reality on a daily basis with his own office inside the arena now, which never happened before. But all this being said, going to somehow to what Christo said, I have, I have to say that in all these seven, eight years that I spent in Fenerbahce, I basically, I've always been able to, let's say, uh, coordinate and all the decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say make all the decision because the decision, uh, Christos is right. You need to make them together with the people around you. I mean, right. uh, it was with Obradovic, it's with Kokoskov, it's with all the components, it's with the club ownership group. So you need to coordinate the people's, people's mind. But I never had this sort of, uh, let's say, uh, any sort of pressure in going one way or the other way, mm -hmm. but always support a, let's try to make, what we think is the best possible decision. And then, of course, sometimes you make good decisions, sometimes decisions are not as good. But, and I have to say that, for example, I had the privilege to live uh, 14 years in Treviso with maybe a very similar situation to what uh, Christos is experimenting today with Armani. I had it with Mr. Benetton. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Benetton was the same kind of person, a great, passionate guy, but not always available because very busy, giving you the input, giving you the freedom to operate, and, and, and again, enjoying the, the basketball, uh, let's say, adventure from the outside, but not putting the wrong pressure on making one decision or another decision, which is, I think, ideal in our jobs because we need to try to make the best possible decision thinking all the pros and contras away from anybody's, let's say, mood or feeling or, or whatever. And uh, because we are supposed to be the, let's say, professional people in charge of this process. Uh, Paulius, you, you have a different, different situation than, yeah, than these guys. Our president is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you how many times has the president wanted to fire the GM? That's, that, yeah. that's how many times have you had an argument with the president and, and or, or vice versa? For people who don't understand, I, I mentioned it in the opening. Let me express that that Paulius is not only the GM of the team, but he also takes over the president role. So that's a double role, which can make life easier, I assume, because you don't have as many people to answer to as our other two guests here today, but it can make life more difficult because all the pressure's on you. Well, you know, I, I had experience uh, working in the club. So when I came in, we had a couple of shareholders and and uh, and Sabas was the president. Uh, Arvida Sabonis was the yeah, president. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's a bad start right off the bat, that Sabonis <laughs> being the president. 
I, I, you know, when I said an idiot, I talked about myself, not, not about <laughs> him, obviously. But I think it all comes down. So then after that, we had one shareholder who, called, who was the president. He was always calling himself an owner and, and that did everything himself. He wanted to control the players, fired the coaches three times a season and, you know, was controlling the minutes and so on and so forth. So I had the share of seeing different ways it's managed. And, uh, but it still comes down to the same thing, what Christos and Maurizio are saying. It's that you have to do the job. And, uh, you know, and then you have a responsibility. It doesn't matter who is the president above you. You as a GM are responsible for how the team performs because you, you choose the coach, you choose the players together with the coach. Some GMs maybe do it without. I, I do it together with the coach. So the president is, you know, a, a great responsibility. And I love when the president can give the trust to the guys like Christos and, and Mauricio. I think it's essential. But we are the guys as GMs who are with the team, who know everything inside and out. Right. Maybe the team managers know even everything better because they go to practices and everything. Like, I, I don't do that anymore. But before, like, we still are the guys who have to manage everything and take responsibility. So uh, I, the president, if he gives trust to GM, I think it's the best thing. But then it's GM's opportunity to bring the results and, and to see that the team performs. And the team, if the team doesn't perform, you take the responsibility and, and you're the one to blame. And that, that, that I mean, <clears throat> that's a lot of pressure for each one of you, no matter what, because even though there's so many other people involved in your decisions, you still are responsible for those decisions. So that, that's, you, you don't have much control of your, over your own destiny sometimes as a GM. But I, I want to ask, I want to get into a little bit of the a day by day, for example. <clears throat> and I'll ask each one of you a different question. Polly, I'll start with you. A day to day for you as a GM, let's say, I'll give you an example. The team's moving along fine. Everything's going well. You're in mid season. Uh, you're fighting for the playoff spot. I'll put it in your situation. You guys are in the middle of the playoff fight, whatever. What's your day-to-day -day like? In, in What are you doing day-to-day? -day? Are you just keeping an eye on what's going on within the team? Are you looking to the future? Are you looking to the younger teams? What is the day-to-day? -day? Basically everything. I mean, when, when the season is going, so uh, the schedule goes, I, I, like, I like to travel with the team. I, I try to go to all the places I can as much as possible. But, but normally, it's just if it's game time here, and let's go to the times where we were allowed to have fans. So, you mm -hmm. know, you worry about the ticket sales because that's your income. You worry about the, you also worry about the, the sponsors. You have to have the deals ready to, to get to get everything moving, then we have uh, important share or to work with municipality and, and to have contacts with, with them and, and the mayor. And, and, then, and then there's a junior team, then there's the arena itself, then there's a, then there's a basketball team. So there's like day to day, it never stops. Uh, if, and, and you try to see how much time needs to put in, you know, into the hot places, how I call it. So you're putting out fires all the time. Yes. So if a team is doing good, like you're saying, you can skip the game. You can, you know, stay and worry about the sponsors or if it's really essential now for us to, to find the budget and talk to the politicians about all the COVID situation. So you tend to stay and, and solve the big issues. But if the team is struggling, you know, you have to forget everything and go with the team and, and see what's, you know, not through the television set, and, and as a fan, look at what's going, but you have to be there and, and see what, how the team performs during the pressure and, and where we are breaking and, and what needs to be solved. And you have to be there with the coaches, with the, with the players and, and so on and so forth. Christos, pretty much the same question I'm going to ask you, but on the opposite end, things are going poorly. A player two that you sign not living up to your expectations or the, or the coach's expectations sometimes. Change may have to happen. How long do you let that player hang in there? How much patience do you have? How much conversation do you have? Are you already looking for somebody else? Are you, are you already searching the market, so to speak? Uh, every, every day, every day, we have to stay close one to each other. Uh, uh, it's obvious, it is normal for some players to, to not be in uh, 
we say in the, in the perfect condition for the whole year, but uh, in, uh, when he needs our support, my support, I'm talking about me, I'm always there to, to support uh, the player, the team, the coach, in order to, uh, to, to succeed and uh, to get uh, the results. Uh, obviously, every, every day, as uh, Paul you said, uh, we are working for the present and for the future. But uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot forget that uh, we are living in the middle of the pandemic. That is not, is not an easy situation. It's not an easy period. So we, we have to adjust. Uh, I think that uh, this year we adjust a lot. Uh, last year, we, we, were, we were in the middle of very difficult time. Uh, we suspend, we, all, we, we, uh, we remember that we suspend, uh, unfortunately, the season. Uh, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy that now we are in the middle of April and uh, we are still playing and uh, we are going to finish the season. This is a big result for everybody, from the organization, from the clubs, for every, from every single part of this competition. And I'm very happy for that. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, because in this, in this, in this situation, uh, uh, as a team, we, we try uh, to educate our players, every member of the staff, taking this situation very seriously. Uh, uh, was very difficult to learn to compete uh, during the games without uh, fans. And this was very, very difficult. Not only that it impacts the teams on the court, but also impacts the club financially. Uh, here in Milan, we, we try to be creative in create the right atmosphere. Uh, we try to use our digital platforms uh, uh, with, uh, uh, to work with the sponsor and uh, with our uh, uh, partners. Uh, we provide to our fan access to the digital platform uh, streaming to watch uh, the games. And uh, we, we are going to, to, to finish the season uh, in the correct way. Uh, we had some difficulties last season uh, because the NBA free agency was late. Right. Uh, but uh, we had the opportunity uh, with the lockdown last year uh, to build our strategy early. And uh, we used this uh, quarantine time last year to be uh, more productive and effective, I would like to say. It's obvious that you've been in journalism and TV because you, you've actually skipped up until some of the questions I have later in the interview, but <laughs> that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, one question I have a kind of a, a, an interesting question for myself because I, I played back in the 80s and the early 90s and things were different. This is towards you, Maurizio, because obviously you, you've taken ownership of being the oldest person in the interview. So, As a matter of fact, I thought you played in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can we... Can, I mean, it seems like guys in London. Can we just cut him off? Can we get him off the interview real quick? <laughs> It might have been the 70s. I don't know. But when I talk to these players, I try to make them realize how much easier it is to come to Europe and play nowadays because of technology, uh, FaceTime, uh, WhatsApp, uh, telephone calls, uh, coaches speaking English, you guys, GMs speaking English. When I came, nobody spoke English in Spain. Nobody, nobody talked to me. I had one translator who couldn't speak English to begin with, and, and he had to translate things to me. So when I did things wrong, I got yelled at by the coach in a language I didn't understand, you know? And then, did these, did these um, difficult moments of, of players coming, foreign players, I, I'm really speaking more about towards Americans because it's a lot of Americans, 
Do they still have trouble adapting, Maurizio, like they did when you were probably younger as a GM? Because it was difficult to adapt for a lot of players back then. I just feel like it's still difficult, but easier. Well, um, <clears throat> you always need to adjust. I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, where you are or, you know, when all this process was taking place. Uh, uh, one of the most rewarding feelings I have today is when I talk to millennials or you know to young students and I and I try to tell them how my life as a GM was back then you know when you were playing you know and uh, um, when I started as as a, let's say working for my basketball club think about this there was no computer, no cell phones. Look at no you do, you're, you're doing the same thing Christos is doing. You're gonna jump ahead of my interview. No, Go ahead. What I'm saying is, <laughs> no, I don't want that too, but, but I don't want that. But I'm saying the adjustment uh, is needed everywhere, anytime. It was needed mm -hmm. 40 years ago, it's needed today. Today, you have everything to have, uh, you know, 40 years ago, as you know, uh, I'm saying in, in a nice way, Dino Menegin, was an NBA player, right. but he didn't know what NBA was all about because NBA was something that you couldn't even grab a week later after the game was played. Today, you have NBA in your pocket and you know exactly what's going on anywhere in the world. So it's a different level of knowledge. So the mental adjustment is much quicker, but still mm. you go to a new, a new situation, you go to a new place, wherever you go, there is an adjustment that you have to make. I think uh, today's, uh, uh, let's say, executives, uh, today's coaches, today's structure of the clubs, whether you are in Milano or Kaunas, or any, are, are definitely at a different level than if, you know, two, three decades ago. So mm -hmm. the, the help that we can bring to the players, especially the, the, the American players coming is, is definitely of much better quality, but still the player has to make an adjustment. And we need to find a way to support him the best possible way because we don't know where he's going to need our support. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, to understand the exchange rate or to know where to eat or uh, to understand the coach's philosophy. It's, uh, right. uh, it's in you know, different ways, but the adjustment is still needed today, even with the higher degree of knowledge of everything that is going on. Tell either, either, this question is for either one of you. You can jump in at any time and answer this, but I'd like to know a little bit in detail of that, the moment where you might have doubted yourself as signing a player, or you, or you might have doubted the team that you put together because you didn't sign certain players, or whatever, but but it worked out like, cause everybody knows the best part of your job is obviously winning and, and being successful and making money for the club. And, but what's that one moment where you said, Oof, I don't know if this player is going to work. And then he ends up being a great player. You don't have to mention names or vice versa, or it was not what you expected as a GM. What was that moment where you said, man, I, I, I did the right thing. Congre you know, where you pat yourself on the back, like, congratulations, Paulius, congratulations, Chris, congratulations, Marisa, you, you did a good job. Do you guys have a moment like that in your career? Either one of you. Hear, I want to hear my friends first. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, uh, I think we all make, we all, I think, I have no doubts that we all try to make the best possible decision every time we make a decision. But uh, the moment we say that, it's, uh, it's part of our job, understanding that we're also going to make mistakes, you know. Uh, when I talk, for example, about the first part of my GM life, uh, in, working in Fort Lee, in, in my hometown, I made mistakes. But at the same time, I was enjoying a brilliant career in banking. So I had a parachute in my life right. and uh, it's a different let's say degree of risk right definitely this change when i went to benetton because uh, there was no parachute in, in in banking 
and and the decisions had to be uh, you know they were taking you to uh, uh, you know to live all the consequences uh, i don't want to i don't want to get into names and because it's not uh, but i want to give an example and I, you know you make your decision you you take your family you, you jump to a new life and uh, and you take all the risk from this life you know people thought when i left my bank job that i was cuckoo to leave such a you know uh, uh, such a nice comfortable you know uh, zone to to take a risk and become a basketball gm and i remember that it happened at one point that uh, uh, the ceo in my in my new position told me hey this season because of the choice you made uh, you know, things are struggling and it's better if you, you know, probably think about dumping someone in order to save you, yourself. And um, it was the most critical moment of my experience in, in my new dimension, you know. And I remember I went home and, and, and I wanted to share with my, with my family. And um, it was... Uh, Let's say their feedback was a hey, go through the decision that you feel like it's the best decision. You know, I know it's risky. We don't control something at times. We can only control certain aspects of an equation, but be comfortable in making your decision. And the following day, I went to the CEO office and he was expecting me to make radical changes. And I said, uh, I'm going to stick with this. I, we're going to go on this this way with these people. And he asked me, you know what you're risking, right? And, uh, and I said, yes, I know what I'm risking. And, uh, and that was the most critical moment because I knew that my future, my job, everything was on the line. And, uh, and, and it, it was a very, let's say, sensitive, delicate, or, you know, moment that I will never forget. At the same time, you know, by, I guess by luck, by coincidence, um, I had also managed to keep a little bit of a budget to make a small change in the, in, in the roster. But to mm -hmm. make a long story short, we turned things around, we won a trophy, we made the playoffs, and I saved my position. And, uh, but then again, that particular moment is one moment that I will never forget out of all my, let's say, GM, uh, you know, career. And, uh, and I think we all live moments, moments like this. How, how difficult, uh, Christos, I, I'm not, I don't know if this question actually is, is a exa great example for you, but I'm sure somewhere along the line you've seen it or heard about it. GMs have friends, obviously, or you become friends with a coach that you sign, that you hire. Um, how difficult is it to make with the decision like Mauricio is talking about right now, a decision to have to fire maybe a coach that you brought in because he's, he was a friend. Obviously, he's qualified. I mean, you don't just bring in a friend to coach a big team if he's not qualified to coach that team. But how difficult of a, is it to sit down with that person and say, listen, this, is, this isn't working. You know it's not working. We have to let you go. You know, to tell you the truth, here, here the situation is, uh, is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, different because uh, regarding me, uh, the, the ownership and the coach that is the president of a basketball operation chose me. So they brought me here. Right. So, but uh, always, always, I think the key of the success is to, to have a... Uh, 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 the right, uh, uh, the, 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 the right, uh, uh, how we say, relationship with the coach every day, and this, this you earn day, day by day. Uh, so, but, but but you do become friend friendly with that coach, whether it's just with him, family. I, I have I have the privilege to work with uh, many many big coaches uh, in my in my career, and uh, with all the coaches I had a great relationship because my motto and uh, my policy is 
to not only to work with the coach, but to help the coach. And this is, this is very important. This is very important, I think. And, and, but how hard is it to let go of that coach, to sit down and to call, to call him into your office? Christos is a great journalist, but an even better politician. You know, you will find that. <laughs> I think that's, I think what I'm getting is a little bit of what Maurizio is saying that making that first decision, making that, that being, let's say that virgin decision, the first time you have to fire somebody, you have to like look them in the eye and say, you know, I, I just opened up a business here and I'm working with people that I want to fire every day. Never, <laughs> never is easy to fire someone. Mm -hmm. never is. Even if it's a coach or a, or your uh, stamp, staff member, uh, never easy, never easy, but uh, is, uh, is part of the process, I think. Right. What about agents? You guys obviously have a relationship with agents. Paulius, I'll direct this one towards you. Uh, I, I would like to reflect a little yeah, bit please, on those previous do. questions too. Like, uh, I, I, I watched Moneyball many times. Ah, yeah, I, one of my favorites. I, yeah, one of the favorites, I think, for all the, the managers that everybody in sport. And uh, there was there is this scene when he's driving the car and he's saying, uh, talking to himself and he's saying, what the F am I doing <laughs> when he's trying to change the system? So I think your first question, is especially to Maurizio, was in this direction. And I, I had that too when, uh, when we were not on the basketball side, but on the arena side, when we had that previous owner mm -hmm. and the arena was built and there was a tender to go into who wants to operate the arena. And I said, we have to do it. You know, all the NBA teams do it. They have the uh, arenas and that's a big one in Kaunas. And he's like, no, everybody's saying it's going to be a deficit to run the arena. And I said, no, we're going to make it work. You know, we've been to the NBA. We've seen how it's done and, you know, it's going to be a profit. And he's the money guy. He owns right. the bank. And I'm telling him that we're going to be making profit. <laughs> and he's saying no. And then, you know, he said, can you guarantee? I said, yes, I can guarantee. And he's like, can you guarantee we'll be making, you know, one, one million liters at that time. It's about 300,000 euros a, right. a, a year. I said, yes. And he said, sign me a paper that you're going to do it. Were, were, making, were, were you actually able to guarantee that or are you just saying yes? I signed the, no, I signed the paper. I was making 2,000 <laughs> euros a month and I said, you know, hell, you know, we 2,000 liters a month. And I said, we're going to make 1 million. And uh, that's, you know, then I'm going down and like, I'm an idiot, you know, but, but <laughs> the decisions, the, you, it, it comes and goes and that's it. And, and with the coaches, like, like Christo said, of course, I, I mean, I'm still a good friend with the, with the coach who is now in China, Gintaras Krapikas, and I, you know, he was my mentor. I started with him, and, and first I fired the coach who was my coach when I came in. Then I took Gintaras in, who, who we became really good friends, and I had to fire him twice, and I'm, you know, I, I, I still have a friend. Right. And even in the arena, I had to fire my best friend because of a political situation. And, you know, these decisions, you, you know, everybody has to face them in the job. And you have an, I always say you have an option to quit yourself. You can right, always come course. and say, OK, thank you. It's done. It's too much. And I go. But you have responsibility towards the team. You have responsibility towards your goals. And, you know, you have to live with that. So, so it's never easy. With the agents, it's more easy. <laughs> with the agents, it's more easy, you know? <laughs> because, you know, the agents work for the players. They don't right, work for the clubs. And uh, it's, we all have this different... That, that's, not, that's not all the cases. Some, some agents work for clubs also somewhere around Europe. I, I've had that too, <laughs> but I, you know, I, you have to know what's, what's, the, what's the real thing. I mean, right. And you have to tell that, you know, you look at it this way. If the player is going to be bad or if the club is going to suffer... The agent won't be there to say, okay, I got your back. You know, I'll right, take you out. You will not have any financial losses. Uh, I'll give you your wins back and stuff like that. So, right. so you know, they cannot be fair. The, the agent the will coach, just send you another player and charge you more. Yes, exactly. <laughs> with, the, with the coaches, it's different. With the coaches, you know, you're in this together. Like, you, you have to trust the coach. If you don't trust the coach, you cannot find him. Right. And if you trust the coach, you have the responsibility for him. Like, we signed Martin Schiller to come from the NBA and he was in the NBA and he took his family back to Europe, you know, from the NBA to work in, in a club like Jalgiris. 
So he sacrifices a lot. And, mm -hmm. and this shows how much he trusts you and your decision. So that's what I say, you know, if things will go back for him, I will have to be there, you know, to make the decision better for the club, but I also have to worry about him and our relationship right. and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a mix of everything, but it's, I think it's everywhere the same thing. Yeah, that's a great example. That's a great example. Of that. No, I'm sorry. I'm Go sorry. ahead, Christos. I would like to, uh, what uh, Paolo said, that, uh, I think that it's very important to, to create uh, with the agents win-win situations. Uh, especially now, especially now that the market is not so easy. Uh, we, know, we know that uh, more of uh, our best players, uh, we lose them uh, for the NBA with, with, uh, with the NBA economy uh, that is, uh, is very strong. It's, uh, it's not easy to keep our best uh, uh, players. So with the collaboration with the agent, our preparation, our staff preparation, scouting and everything, we, we, we try to find uh, the, uh, the, the, the right, uh, the right uh, choices. I remember back in 2008, if you remember in Olympiacos, we brought George Childers. George Childers mm -hmm. still the most expensive contract until today. Right now, this type of players, they are never coming in, in, in Europe. It's very, it's very difficult. So uh, we have to find other, other, uh, other solutions to, to use the tools that we have with scouting and everything in order to make the correct uh, and uh, the right choices. That, that's great because you're, you're again you're leading me into our next topic, which is kind of like team and 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 project building. Um, I, f I feel fortunate that I have you three sitting down with me because it's three different types of clubs, so to speak, over the last let's say eight to ten years, five to eight years, whatever. We have Fenerbahce who who just before Zelko arrived was just starting to to, to become a a club in Europe again. Zelko's arrival uh, slowly became uh, a bigger team. There was more of a budget. There was more money to be spent with Zelko. We Zalgirdas is a, a club that seems to be always based on morals, on a winning attitude. Obviously, you guys have limited resources compared to other teams. A playoff appearance, a couple of years, the last couple of years, were celebrated. A third place finish was a successful season for you guys, which I thought was amazing. And then we have Milan, a club that's that's based with so much history, as you mentioned before, because there's a, a winning mentality way back in the, as Marisa said, in the 70s and 80s when I played. But Italy Italy went through a tough crisis, as as most of Europe did, and, and Milan kind of suffered with that. Didn't make it to the play, haven't, hasn't made it to the playoffs since 2014. That's changed this year. Congratulations, by the way. That uh, you guys are in it. So we have three different types of clubs here. So as far as like building a project and having ups and downs, uh, Marisa, I'll start with you. Economically, I feel like things have changed a bit since Zelko showed up. Uh, and he alone was a big investment, but you also invested in players like Bogdanovich, Datomi, uh, just to name a few. But yeah. it, it, it just didn't, success didn't show up on your doorstep. It was a five-year plan. I mean, before you guys actually, you were successful, but you didn't win any titles for a while. Well, uh, to be precise, actually, we hadn't made ever to the Final Four. No Turkish team had ever made it to right. the Final Four. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, thinking that uh, we collected five consecutive Final Fours, and uh, with this year, we've made six consecutive playoff appearances. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost, uh, let's say, unbelievable. Um, on the other hand, yes, we had resources, but uh, we needed to identify a path, uh, you know, a goal. What do you want to achieve? What do we see today that is not working? And this was the first thing when I arrived in, in Istanbul and sat down with, with uh, Zerko. And, uh, and Zelko showed me the, the picture and I said, hey, but where do we want to go? What is the need? And in, and in basically in one season and two, three months, we changed the entire roster. Only two players were left of the initial right. roster because we wanted 
more athleticism. We wanted hungrier people. We wanted to, you know, improve certain areas. We wanted also to play, you know, a different probably style of basketball. More, you know, uh, we wanted to be more aggressive overall. And uh, and again, the way we wanted to play also helped us leading into selecting uh, the, the the team personnel. At the same time, I've always been. Uh, and Jerko knew from our Benetton years, because just like uh, Christos mentioned before, and I think Paulius can say the same through his career, we, we as manager, we always had the privilege to, to work with, with great coaches. And, right. uh, and again, uh, when I think that I, all the years I spent with Jerko, almost 10 years, and, and, and Messina, and Blatt, and D'Antoni, uh, four years with Mike D'Antoni. And uh, um, again, you feel privileged to have gone through all these experiences, but you also try to follow uh, some sort of a building philosophy, which in my case is I always, I always like to have some sort of a one of two, let's call it building projects that you want to implement in the roster that you're building, because that reflects in... Uh, let's say developing talent, but also creating a, let's say a beneficial situation for your club if the talent becomes too good, because then you have a potential NBA buyout or potential asset that you can trade on the market or whatever. But uh, uh, let's say we had resources, we built on, let's say, uh, getting the best available talent uh, in creating this puzzle. And, uh, and we were very lucky to land players like, uh, you know, Bogdanovic, uh, like uh, uh, Datome, like Slukas, like Kalinic. Uh, but at the same time, we started from a picture where we had already the other Bogdanovic. We had Bielita, we had, you know, we had talent. Right. And, um, and today, I think we, that was the initial picture. Today it was almost, I don't want to say the opposite, but resources whether it was for pandemic reason or for, the, the, let's say, the uh, club decision in, in terms of overall, uh, you know, expenses of the big uh, family of Fenerbahce, we had to deal with, you know, quite a significant change in, uh, in the size of, of the budget. So we were called to make different sort of decisions, but still sticking somehow to the same idea of, uh, prioritizing potential, let's say, uh, pieces that can grow up along the path that you're trying to build with this roster. And, and again, uh, we were very lucky, no secrets, we were very lucky to land a player like Guderich in the middle of the season because he's still a very young player mm -hmm. and he's still developing, but he ended up being the right glue to, you know, make all the other pieces uh, function. Right. He stepped uh, right in for for, for Bodanovic. Right. But but again, uh, this is uh, let's say sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's ability, sometimes it's a combination of factors. But I think uh, in in general you always try to have a let's say uh, some sort of a concept of roster building where you can in, you can have veteran players players in their prime time, prospect players, domestic players. You, you try to, this is the way I, I follow to try to put the best possible roster together. Well, in, in your case, um, you seem to have to do this on a yearly basis for, for many different reasons. So, and I, I guess maybe the budget, that you guys don't have a, as big of a budget. As I said before, you, you, the, the, the when you talk about Zalgiris in, in Europe, you talk about one of the, morally one of the best teams around. I mean, you see how amazing the, the, the offices are, the treatment of the players. Everybody talks about it. You guys have a winning team from year to year. Uh, your goals are different than other teams uh, in the league sometimes. But other people thrive on the fact that you bring over, you put these teams together you bring over these guys that some people don't know sometimes and all of a sudden they get up and they leave because they go to bigger teams with bigger budgets, whatever. How difficult is that for you on a yearly basis to put that team together to be successful? 
I think building the team together is the, the biggest fun that you have in, in this job because they don't get to play together. You just put them in the picture and you imagine that this is the EuroLeague winning team. Right. And, and I have it every summer. Uh, and then, you know, it, it doesn't work and, it, and you have to move on. <laughs> but uh, uh, like before, before Sharas, I would say like before Sharas, we used to have uh, a team of local guys and we would bring uh, the, like Maurizio said, the international guys who were going, you know, the prime was already over and they, we had, we wanted experience that the guys could play. So it's either someone like Marcus Brown coming out of the injury or, you know, somebody else who has not shown themselves uh, cannot get that result anymore. And, and when Sharas came, it changed because he wanted to have guys who have been in Europe, who ha had something to prove. Right. And we are the best place to prove because we get a lot of playing time for them. Like you said, we, we, have, we have really good facilities. And number one is that we have crazy fans. Like <laughs> you, have, you have a full arena, everybody will support you. Everybody will, will, will show emotion if you play good or bad. And, and, and you have to play good because you cannot, you know, you cannot stop trying in front of 15,000 people who, you know, who, can, who are cheering for you. So, right. so that changed with Sharas and that's how we got, you know, Michich, we had, we had Pangos, we had Brandon Davis. Exactly. Just to may, name a few that, you know, went on to play to, to the teams, to the teams that, you know, now we have Zach Day with Christos. We, we have, we had other guys in, in, uh, with Maurizio and so on and so forth. So you just have to know that you are that team. And I keep telling them, you know, mostly it's because of the budget that we cannot give these guys a guaranteed contract for five years and right. that nobody else can give them bigger money. We, we cannot do that. So, so for foreigners, you use that, you know, that mindset that we have to find someone who's ready to prove himself, try hard and, and play as much as they can. I think, you know, there are other teams who are this way too, like especially this year or, or previously as Cervena Zvezda. Right. And, and I think other Serbian teams as well that, that, you know, have the same attitude that the locals have to be there and they you know in our case the backbone is always Lithuanians so mm -hmm. we have Jan Kunas who's been for us for many many years <laughs> and now if he's finishing the career then you know it's a difficult question who takes over the locker room right and and you know when you have a guy like Jan Kunas it's quite easy you know to give him one or two other Lithuanians and then they control the locker room and then they give that fighting mentality and they explain what the fans were saying what the media is saying because the pressure is enormous so you know this is I think we are not the only ones who work this way but but I love it like I said the most fun is just building the team together and you have different coaches you have different way they understand basketball and I'm just learning from each coach every year. And uh, I just, I can only say what I experienced, but I cannot say if that play is good or bad. Like there were even players that I didn't want to sign, but the coach said, let's sign them. And they ended up being great, great players. Mm -hmm. So you have to always listen to the guy who, you know, who runs the team. Christo, Christos, I, I saved you for last year because you've had a couple of big summers. I mean, I, everybody worked hard last summer because of the COVID and, issue and everything else and so we'll get into that in a minute but you you brought in Ethereum Messina Sergio Rodriguez first a couple summers ago which are two big names one is obviously a classic name um, this summer was Kyle Hines Gigi Datomi you went you kind of mixed the team with like some veterans some young guys um, with a, with a big time coach and, and it's a nice mix of player how those how hard was it to get that group of guys together to commit to um, to a new attitude, to a culture that that you're trying to change in Milan. It's obvious that you're trying to change things in Milan. Milan has, has struggled over the years. I mean, we're not. No one's going to lie to anybody and say that it's been a great team. They've had their struggles over the years, and you're trying to turn that. It, was it hard to convince people to come to your project and and to develop this new team? First of all, I, I will add uh, what Paulus said about the, the fun of every summer to build the team. It's not only a fun, but also a big challenge for everybody right. uh, to, to build this team. Uh, 
Uh, so I used uh, my uh, 19 years experience with Olympiacos and uh, we tried to integrate with uh, Ettore Messina experience in the NBA world and we tried to use the best of the, these two worlds and apparently is, uh, is working. Our main focus, uh, we say, was to create a culture about how to do things, which values, uh, hard working and create a family environment. And the first, we have here, we have a first class practice facility. Uh, so this kind of culture uh, should be the legacy that we want to leave to the next generation of, of people that we will be in charge in this uh, organization. Uh, I think that was not so difficult to explain to all these players about our project. And I'm very happy that everybody understand and wanted to follow this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, pro project. Uh, for sure, the presence of Ettore Messina was crucial. And uh, so we were able to convince high quality professional uh, to, to come here with us. I remember last year, Sergio Rodriguez with uh, Luis Cola uh, last year, and uh, this year, as you said, Kyle Hines, Malcolm Delaney, uh, Gigi Datome. Uh, all those guys have been signed because on top of being great players, they are perfect to, to build this kind of, uh, of, court, of culture. And uh, together, uh, as I said previously, we, we had a, a plenty of time to work during uh, the, the lockdown to make our strategy. And uh, we are sure that we found uh, the, the right players to combine with these experienced players, uh, young players like uh, Zach, uh, like uh, Kevin Panther, like Savon, uh, Savon uh, Seals. That was the main point of the way that we are building uh, our, our uh, project. And this is what we want to try to do in the future, looking to keep this culture uh, and uh, to find all, always players that they can follow this, uh, this, uh, this project. The, the team building is, is an amazing thing because as, as I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys and I, obviously we did our research and I've learned a, a lot of things about you personally. I've learned a lot of things about the job through you guys talking, but changes are are ever present in your job. Obviously, everything changes on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. And Maurizio, in your case, Selko left the team. He decided to take another year of sabbatical. I'm sure that your friendship with him, you talked about it, you discussed it with him, you knew it was going to happen, and 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 it just happened. But you go and sign a guy who is known in Europe, but known more in the basketball world is, as being a, a, an incredible coach, but not so much here in Europe. And the team doesn't do so well in the beginning. As a matter of fact, there was probably the worst month or two that you guys have had in the last five years. What, what's going through your mind when, when... You're a nice guy. You underline <laughs> my birthday. You underline our shitty times. You know, you're hey, a good guy. I'll, I'll talk but about your good you times. Did, I wouldn't come on this podcast, you know, that's for sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was only a bit of my interview with three of the best GMs in all of EuroLeague. Stick around because they're going to be part two coming up real soon. And you're going to be listening to more inside information, more day-to-day, -day, and more of the most important part of being a general manager in the EuroLeague on the next edition of The Crossover with Joe R. Lucas.